So I'm showing that it's six o'clock and I, I want to welcome you to our first ever uh, virtual district decision making committee meeting. Um, my name is Melissa Hayhurst. I'm the executive director for assessment and authentic learning. Um, and I want to say how much uh, the, that we appreciate you taking time this evening to join us. Um, I have to admit, while it's easier in a lot of ways for us to organize this meeting when we have a normal situation, it is certainly comfortable to be able to join from home. And, and I know that all of us are feeling that way, particularly since it's six o'clock. Um, as I said, I wanted to welcome you. There are a few people I need to introduce at the beginning and they will be making presentations throughout the evening. Um, and first, I want to begin with Dr. Roger Brown, our Deputy Superintendent, Mike Seal, our Chief Financial Officer, Jamie Bryson, um, our Executive or our Director of State and Federal Programs, Dr. Jamie Bryson, I should add, uh, Dr. Warren Roan, a Director of Accountability, Dr. Ann Johnson, the Chief Academic Officer and my uh, partner in crime. Um, in addition, Stephanie Coronado, Melissa Lee, and Debbie Perez will be joining us from Teaching and Learning. And then Mary Kay Janutsis from Assessment and Accountability will also be presenting this evening. And so with that, I just want to lay out a few norms because we are a rather large group. Um, and so what we are going to do for all of the DDM members, you have access to the chat. And if you have a question at any time, I'm asking that you put your question in the chat and one of the um, hosts will make sure to ask that question uh, when it's uh, fitting at a time when we're in the middle of, of um, at, towards the end of a topic, they will certainly address your question. I wanted to let you know that the meeting is being recorded. Um, we obviously need to do that for our regulation purposes, not only because of District of Innovation, but also because of the District Decision Making Committee. Uh, with that, I believe we can get started. Um, our overall purpose, for those of you who may be first time members to the District Decision Making Committee, you may be wondering why are we doing this? It is an expectation that we meet at least once a year to talk about district goals. What are our district goals? How are we progressing with our district goals? Sharing things such as our state assessment performance, um, as well as our funding and how it's been aligned to our district goals. Dr. Bryson will be going over a lot of that information with you along with Dr. Roan. Obviously, this year has been a little bit um, unusual, to say the least. And so next year when DDM comes back together, um, the assessment piece will be interesting because obviously all of our state testing was waived this semester simply because we were at home. Um, and so that's just a very big picture of DDM. Uh, Dr. Bryson, is there anything that you would like to add? Sorry, I had to unmute. No, I, I think that's a good introduction. I, I would like to say there are a couple people that are in as attendees that we do not recognize on our DDM membership list. So uh, you're okay. welcome to join in the meeting. Absolutely, because it is a public meeting um, and we do welcome you. So the purpose of our meeting uh, tonight is twofold. One of them has to do with the District of Innovation and a proposed amendment that Mr. Seal will present to us in just a moment. And then the other piece will be the review of the district goals and, and other traditional DDM business. And so with that, I wanna get started with District of Innovation. Again, for those of you who may not be aware of exactly what the District of Innovation is, it essentially, and I provided you with a, a brief um, summary of the District of Innovation but it is a concept that was passed by the 84th legislature. And essentially, it allows public schools a lot of the um, flexibilities that are available to uh, charter schools. And thus, several years ago, we became a district of innovation. And Jamie, if you'll scroll down a little bit so that everyone can see, 
Um, in 2016, it was our first venture into the District of Innovation, and quite frankly, it had a lot to do. Uh, Dr. Sconzo had received notice from the state of Texas that our professional learning, our late arrival professional learning was no longer going to be waived. If it was something we wished to continue, we would need to go through the District of Innovation because that's how the state was going to handle those particular kind of waivers going forward. And so that propelled us into seeking to become a District of Innovation. And not only did we um, address the length of our instructional day, but we also addressed some other immediate concerns, particularly in regards to teacher certification around our career and technology department. As you are well aware, that is a very specialized field and trying to find certified teachers and by certified, the traditional certification process, who also had the experience that um, career and tech industries required was almost impossible. And so this allowed us some flexibility within um, that particular area to hire people who had the industry hours without necessarily the traditional certification. And then the last piece of it had to do with our waivers, particularly for kindergarten, um, that we would notice that with class size, we certainly want to keep our class size at elementary very low, but there are times that you get one extra kid and rather than splitting, um, it was best to work within um, elevating that, that enrollment just a little bit. So that was our first foray into District of Innovation. Shortly after that, we um, proposed an amendment and it would allow us to begin our school year earlier than the state of Texas um, allowed. And we did that, I believe, year before last. And so here we are today. Um, and so uh, Mr. Steele is going to bring a proposal to you in regards to insurance. Um, and so Mike, I am the floor is yours. Great. Um, Stephanie, um uh, we'll be here to answer any technical questions you've got about the legality that goes along with this. But one of the other options that we can exercise um, through our district of innovation is a, is a, um, an allowance that will enable us to go out and bid health insurance to offer a plan in addition to the current state health insurance plan. Um, the state health insurance plan uh, was written so that once a district is in the plan, you can never get out of the plan. So you are, most districts have been tied to this state plan when premiums go up, when benefits go down, um, whatever we don't like about it, we really haven't got a choice because this district opted into that plan several years ago. Um, under DOI though, we can go out and bid an alternate plan to give our employees an option. And we've started, we're well into that process. We see some benefits. We believe that we can um, offer our employees a plan with lower premiums and better benefits. And they can choose if they want to to stay on the state plan or they can choose to move to this new plan. Um, it really is no more complex than that. Um, if you have any questions about um, insurance, health insurance in general or uh, what we hope to have happen under this new plan, uh, you can post them in the chat area and I'll be happy to answer them or Stephanie can answer them if they are uh, of more of a legal nature, but really that's it. To me, this is an absolute no brainer. Um, we're not taking anything away from the employees. We're not costing them a penny. If we lay a plan out there that an employee doesn't like, they can stay on the state plan or they can stay entirely off of district health insurance and purchase it elsewhere. Um, so it's purely a benefit to district employees and will not be an additional cost to the district. 
So if anybody has any questions, run them through chat and I'll be happy to answer them. If not, um, that's really all that we have to present on this topic. I'll give everybody just another minute. Currently, there are only about four districts. This really started last year, and there are about four districts around the state. One of them, the most notable, is El Paso ISD. Um, the um, rest of them are rather small districts, um, but you're going to see a surge in that direction this year. Uh, let me see what we've got in chat. So Mike, I've got a couple of questions here. The okay. first one is for those on the active care two plan, the one that we technically don't have anymore, but some got grandfathered in, will that still be available for those on the particular plan? We are going to bid only one plan, um, one plan and that plan is a high, the same high deductible plan or equivalent parallel to the high deductible plan we have. Um, so no, we are not going to be able to offer an option for anything other than the high deductible plan this year. It, if things those, go those, well, sorry, go ahead, Mike. My apologies. Go ahead. One thing to if be clear with well, our committee is the fact that TRS is yeah, still going well, to be an option. Yeah, if things go well, we can look at offering other options uh, in the future. But right now. Um, this first year into it, we want to just make sure that every employee has, and the, the premiums are the lowest on the high deductible plan, um, that every employee has an affordable option. Our next question is, so regardless of this decision, the district can never leave the state plan. So right now, under the current state of the law, that is correct. We are still going to be members of TRS Active Care and we are not permitted to opt out of TRS Active Care. What we're asking the committee to review and hopefully approve tonight is the flexibility to offer our own option. This goes back to the, the age old, more competition is better, um, especially because this allows vendors to compete for our business rather than simply being part of the statewide organization. Um, another key point for our, our committee members is the fact that not every community has the same health needs. A major metroplex and a small rural community have very, very different um, client bases when we're talking about health insurance. Um, and this would allow us to get a vendor on board who can tailor their bids to our Umbel ISD community. Um, and the District of Innovation process simply gives us the flexibility to go out and look for those options and get that competition. One of the reasons that this is <coughs> appealing to us for um, in our particular district is we are a healthier district than many of the districts around the state. When you look at <clears throat> some of the largest districts around the state, you look at Houston ISD, you look at San Antonio ISD, El Paso ISD, um, those are communities with more health problems than we have in our particular district. So when <clears throat> when we started in this process of asking companies to bid on our business, they were excited to because they saw that we have a lower claims ratio than uh, the other communities, which is one of the reasons that TRS care is so expensive and benefits are so low. They're averaging us in with all of the unhealthy districts around the state, if you will. So we've got a couple more questions, Mike. Would the new insurance options be available for the 2020-2021 school year? Yes, that's what we're working on and we hope to take a proposal to the board at the June board meeting. Another question is if a teacher opts for the district plan, what effects, if any, might be upon the health care post-retirement? Um, I don't believe there would be any, any impact on it. Um, we have a lot of employees. We only have about 3,000 employees that participate in our health plan, and we have many, many more employees than that. Um, 
and when they retire, um, whether they were on a district, on a TRS health plan or not, you have the same, um, same health insurance options either way. So it wouldn't have any impact. And I got a, a request for clarification. Just to be absolutely perfectly clear, all TRS active care options that TRS is offering, those are still on the table. Now our community, our, our team may have noticed that those options have changed from year to year, whether it's the price of them, the coverage, or what's available, there's been some grandfathering as well. Um, so we really don't have control over what TRS does um, and in many ways, TRS is kind of uh, subject to the fact that they have to serve all of these communities across the state. But if TRS is offering it, it would still be available for Umbel ISD. We I'll would also, have a second choice as well. I'll also throw in just a <clears throat> little bit of information here. We are committed as part of this year's budget process. Um, TRS has, has gone up on their employee only premiums for the next year. And I believe on employee and family, um, not, not by a large amount, but by a little bit, uh, they are reducing employee and um, children uh, cost. Um, but we're committed that at least, if you choose to stay on TRS care, that at least for the employee only, that your premiums will be no higher than they were last year. And, and we're looking at whether we can keep all of those premiums flat. Any other questions for us? If not, we thank you for being a part of this, um, of this process. Um, we think there is nothing but good that will come out of this. Um, if something happened, and I've already seen a couple of bids uh, that look like great options for us. If some, for some reason we got to the June board meeting and decided we were not gonna offer a parallel plan, then you would just kind of be right back where you were. So there's no downside to this. And hopefully there's um, a lot of upside uh, in terms of premium reductions and um, expanded coverage. Mike, we had another question. Would the health insurance companies be possibly different each year? Um, there is that possibility. Uh, with TRS care, they're changing to Blue Cross this next year. <clears throat> we are trying to make a selection where we are confident that we can stay with the company that we select for at least two years. Um, I've been... Um, involved in uh, or in charge of health insurance for the 25 years I've been in this business. Um, it is um, almost impossible, um, somewhere between almost impossible and really, really costly to get an insurance company to make a commitment beyond two years. So we're looking at the, pay, at the rate structure. We're telling the uh, the bidders that we want to be with them at least for a couple of years, we'd like to be with them for more than a couple of years, but there are no guarantees after that, just as there are no guarantees if you're in uh, business or if you're with TRS care. Any more questions? If not, I am going to um, exit. Uh, <laughs> anybody needs me to answer anything for the rest of the uh, rest of y'all's time, then feel free to um, Roger or Melissa can send me a text and I'll hop back on. Thank you so much, Mike. I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, if you will notice on the agenda, you should at this point have received an email from Ginger Curtis. Um, we are going to close this portion of the DDM. Ginger has sent you um, basically a Google form in which to vote. And so I would ask that you take a minute to do that. You should have a link. If for some reason the link is not working, she has also provided you with an option too, in which you can simply email your response 
um, back to her so that we will put it in the full spreadsheet. And with that, I'll give you just a minute as we transition over to our um, official DDM portion of the meeting. And just to, to, for some procedural legal background, if you are a legal nerd like myself, um, this is one step of the process. The first step was to post the proposed amendment on our website, which we've done so. Um, the second was to bring it to you all um, and get a vote of the DDM committee if it's approved by a, it's either two thirds or a majority, um, then it would, the next step would be to go on to the board of trustees. So this vote really is crucial for us to then take it to the board at the regular June meeting. So Jamie, if, if you uh, could start in about 30 seconds, I think that will have given everyone enough time um, and we can go ahead and proceed. Okay, so we'll get started with the district decision making committee. I'd like to welcome many of you back and also welcome any new members that we have joining us. So one of the functions of this committee is to approve our goals and give input in how you receive those goals or if you recommend any uh, changes. Also the same with our district improvement plan. So in your meeting invitation, there is a, a PDF there that gives you the agenda. And so you will be able to link into all of these documents. But for your convenience, I'm going to show them on your screen for now. The first item is our state and federal funding and its alignment with identified needs and goals. And so what we're going to look at here are the five goals of the district and then how we use special state and federal funding to align with those goals. This is in addition to local funding that we have. So our first goal is focused on quality instruction. And in addition to the academic proficiencies that we're seeking, it's also looking at portrait of graduate where we are building skills for effective communicators, global citizens, critical thinkers. Uh, creative innovators, leaders and collaborators, and personally responsible students. The second goal is focused on school safety. The third is attracting and retaining quality staff. The fourth goal is focused on a family-like culture. And then the fifth is resource alignment, so ensuring that all of our resources are aligned and focusing on our highest priorities. So here you can see that we've broken down uh, first, with quality instruction, with advanced academics, we have special state funding to provide teacher salaries, teacher training, uh, Title IV, when our federal funds helps us cover the advanced placement exam fees for economically disadvantaged students. And I'm just going to skim through these a little bit. Um, for at-risk and educationally disadvantaged students, we provide supplemental staff to address the needs of students. We provide instructional materials, instructional technology, uh, title programs, Title I uh, does the same. Title IV, uh, we use to support a performing arts will on Title I campuses and professional development. We have special funding for bilingual ESL, career and technology, culture, high quality staff, safe and healthy students, special education, technology education. And then for resource alignment, with all of our fund sources, um, there are requirements of how we use the funds and then there are limitations of how we may use the funds. And so we're following all of those requirements um, focusing on parent and family engagement. We have some reservations off the top to provide professional development specialists, uh, provide homeless and foster and migrant care. And we coordinate all of these funding sources to make sure that they are aligned with the intended purpose of each fund source, that we're addressing 
the identified needs and that they're prioritized where there is the greatest needs. We're following sound business practices and we're including stakeholder input and this is where we're going to want to hear from you. And we're meeting all funding requirements with the ultimate goal to improve outcomes for students. So these are our goals followed by a description of how we use special state and federal funds to address them. We're also going to look at the district improvement plan. In the district improvement plan, we have identified, well, I'll also mention that as a member of this committee, your names go in the district improvement plan. And so the names in the 1920 plan are last year's committee members, and you all will be in our 2020-21 improvement plan. We have our comprehensive needs assessment that is focused around demographics of the district, student achievement, school culture and climate, staff quality recruitment and retention, curriculum instruction and assessment. And in each of these we break down strengths and needs, family and community involvement, school organization, and technology. So all of the actions in our plan have to be tied back to an identified and prioritized need. And so our actions, you will see the formatting here as we list the goal. And this first one is about quality instruction. We've listed some performance objectives as targets to, to reach for and meet throughout the year. And then we have all of our actions listed that identify what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, and how we're going to know that it is going to and so there's more did that go black for that too okay so after goal one it just follows them with goal two that is focusing on safety goal three attracting and retaining talented staff four is our community uh, culture, family like culture, and five is aligned resources. So those are the two items that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, and in the end, we're going to describe a survey where you can give uh, feedback. Let me just look to see if there were any questions. About no our All right. So then um, the next thing we're going to review is the annual performance report. Uh, Jamie, before we, we do have a question. Okay. Um, so how has the district and state addressed these goals in light of COVID-19? Um, and part of that I think I can answer without a doubt. Um, our our uh, teaching and learning will be addressing a lot of this as far as uh, professional learning for teachers and the instruction that we've provided to students uh, during this time. Uh, but Jamie, is there anything in particular that you want to address um, in response to that question? No. Okay. I would also let the committee know that this agenda along with the links have been included in the calendar drop. And so you should be able to access this um, at your leisure whenever, whenever you wish. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing so Warren can take over. All right, good evening. I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen now. Hopefully, that is successful. So tonight we're going to just briefly talk about uh, the annual performance report uh, that was uh, presented earlier at a, at a different board meeting uh, in the spring of this year. We're gonna look at uh, something from the Texas Education Agency called the Texas Academic Performance Report, and that's the TAPER, T-A-P-R, and that's really the basis of our report. Um, it, 
that report from uh, the Texas Education Agency is sometimes confusing because it has multiple years of data. So it actually has uh, years uh, from 2017, 2018, all the way to the current year. Uh, and this, the full presentation was actually presented originally on March the 17th at a board meeting, and there's the link. Uh, but um, your materials also have a direct link uh, to this website also. This is the, the uh, video recording of the board meeting for March the 17th. Um, as was mentioned earlier um, ab about how many staff members we have in Humble ISD, we have uh, for the 2018-19 school year, we had 5,426 staff members and 67.1% are classified according to TEA as professional staff, which means teachers, professional and administrative support. Also in the TAPR, there's a little bit of financial information regarding the district. Uh, so for in terms of taxes, the district value has 80.9% uh, residential and 17.3% business when you're looking at uh, tax valuation. And the budget uh, spends 62.6% on instructional expenditures. That's the ratio uh, that's calculated uh, from the budget. For the annual performance report, um, the district is uh, increasing as is probably not a surprise to most of you. The population is increasing that one table on the, the upper right. Uh, shows that we had about uh, 10,000 students increase from the year 2019, the fall of 2019 to the fall of 20, I'm sorry, fall of 2010 to the fall of 2019. And at the same time, uh, our population became more diverse. So we had uh, more African American students, more Hispanic students uh, at the same time. So we have becoming more and more diverse and, at the same time that we're a fast growth district. TEA um, analyzes our test data and assigns us a letter grade and something new for the school year 2018-2019 was a letter grade for campuses. Um, all of that information is on a, a relatively new website run by TEA, texasschools.gov, txschools.gov. You can go in it and you get about 30 pages of information or so per campus. And uh, it has a summative letter grade and the district uh, for the year 2019 had a grade of a B. So it's out of A to F, the district made a B. When we look at uh, specific information about STAR for the spring of 2019, uh, STAR uh, is uh, assessed generally every year, not this year, but uh, it has three different uh, levels that students might achieve. Approaches is, is considered passing. Then there's meets and masters. And typically we have in our district, we're near or above the state in all these different content areas uh, in the approaches and the meets. The lower two, the masters in academic growth, are a little bit different. Uh, we're uh, maybe a little bit under the state level and that's because of something happened uh, in this particular year in 2018-19. We had a, a new rule that had to do with substitute assessments. So if you took a substitute assessment, uh, the students weren't included in the master's calculation nor were they included in the academic growth or academic progress calculation. So that accounts for uh, the district is a slightly uh, lower uh, than the state at, at the master's and the, ac and the academic growth level. And we have a little slide that talks about that. So this, the state allowed for that. And in our case, we use the PSAT grade eight and grade nine. Uh, we had several thousand students uh, were able to use that as an alternate assessment, as a substitute assessment. Our district was one of the few in the area to promote these, uh, but, the, but if a student used the substitute assessment, for example, the PSATA, 
they weren't allowed to get the master's level. The most you could make is meets. And also the, these tests were excluded in the progress measure. So these, these students that performed well on the PSAT were not included in our district progress calculations. And uh, the state discontinued use of this, so we won't have uh, substitute assessments in the future. When we look at, uh, again, the TAPR, the Texas Academic Performance Report for the school year 2017-18, they calculate our dropout rates and the annual dropout rate for grades seven to eight was 0%, for grades nine to 12 was 0.6%. When you look at the, the federal uh, calculation for graduation for the cohort of 2018 of the seniors in 2018, we had a 93.7% graduation rate, and we had uh, similarly high uh, for uh, the different uh, demographics that we have listed there. Uh, special education students uh, were the, notably the lowest group, 63.6. But when you use the state uh, calculation, which includes a few more exclusions, we actually had 90% graduation rate. And similar to uh, that, when we look at the, the graduation uh, class of 2018, there was college readiness indicators. Uh, those were included also in the TAPR and almost consistently above the state in the region. Uh, for advanced or dual credit uh, courses, uh, we had 44.2% completion to be considered college ready, meaning scoring high on the ACT or the SAT or the TSI, we had 58.6% of those graduates in that category. And those who took the AP or IB test scored high, uh, meaning they, they were able to get college credit, that's 64.1%. Our mean or our average SAT for those graduates was 1,098. The ACT uh, composite for those students was 22.7. And for the prior year, uh, students who graduated in 2017, 55.6% of those enrolled in higher education the following semester. So they graduated in the spring and they enrolled by the fall of that same year of 2017. And then when they finished one year of college, 65.5% of those students were able to do so without needing remediation. And so we have some data from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, for the class of 2017, we had 2,899 graduates. 24.8% uh, of those went on to four-year Texas public schools. 28.1% went to two-year colleges in Texas, and 3% went to private institutions in Texas. The GPA, uh, again, these are much higher than the state average, but 85.6% of those who went on to four-year institutions uh, had greater than 2.0 GPA, and 65.8% of those who went on to two-year institutions had greater than a 2.0 GPA. Also, this year we, we added some information about our local performance report. So we talked about the PSAT, uh, we talked about our local literacy assessment and also about um, kind of the, the cohort enrollment for college. So we're just going to look at uh, three sample slides from that. Again, all this, uh, the full presentation is, is um, available on our website and also it is uh, recorded from that board meeting. So when you look at the, the PSAT results, what we did is we mapped out students who took the PSAT in grade eight and also in grade nine. And we looked to see what their total uh, score was and if they make growth. And so the blue information, each dot represents one student. And so those who made a gain, uh, which was the majority of those students, uh, the, again, they took the PSAT eight in, in 2018 and they took the PSAT nine grade nine in 2019, and the, the vast majority of students made growth. When you look at our local literacy assessments, uh, 
here we have a sample of uh, first grade and second grade. Each uh, student took uh, a test in, in the fall and then they took another test in the winter. These are the, the growths uh, between the fall and the winter tests. They had certain targets uh, for the fall and they also had certain targets that were uh, slightly higher in the winter because the expectation is their reading ability increases uh, throughout the year. And so uh, the targets increase, but the, the graphs here show how much, how many levels, a reading level, uh, for example, in the first grade, the target was for the winter, uh, a, a letter grade F. Uh, so it was just A, B, C, D, F, G, et cetera. And so we converted that to a numeric grade. So that would be level six. So how many students uh, were on target? And then how much gain did they make from the fall to the winter. Uh, similarly, the second grade uh, winter target was uh, level K, which uh, numerically is an 11. And so how much uh, did the students grow from the fall to the winter? And, and in this graph, the darker the circle, uh, the higher the reading level was in the fall. So Warren, I want to stop you there for just a minute because obviously this is uh, something that is is new to all of us and I would like for um, Ann Johnson maybe to provide a little bit of background to the DDM. Um, obviously we recognize college enrollment, we recognize PSAT, but I would like for Dr. Johnson to just give us a little bit of background about our literacy assessments and, and what uh, what we're seeing with those. Um, several years ago, it's been about three years ago, um, we had conversations with teachers and administrators across the system. And one of the common things that we heard was that they just didn't have enough critical data to really make good, de good decisions about helping students with growth in literacy. We put into place, we created and put into place research-based assessments that are teacher to student which means this, the student actually sits with the teacher and the teacher administers them three times a year. And they're around the five components that we know are foundational for reading. So what you see is this is really preliminary data because we started a pilot a year ago. Um, this past year would have been the first full year we would have done this. And, and unfortunately, um, we ran into a little snag here in the spring. Um, but the preliminary data has been extremely helpful and the teachers have at their fingertips in both the fall, winter and spring, the information on each child so they can make immediate adjustments in the instructional process. The other um, interesting fact is Rob Moe, who is a programmer in our department, has put together a wonderful uh, report for parents so you can see immediately um, where your child is and through that process, collaborate with the teacher to determine how you can work in a partnership with them to really help your child continue their growth in literacy. So we're excited about this continuing. Um, we actually are training, we're in the process of training our third, fourth and fifth grade teachers and we'll be we hopefully, hopefully will be implementing them this fall. The other point I just like to make because we have been, it's just been an, an interesting year. We are prepared at the beginning of the year to administer these if we can. And they will be really critical because we can't wait for end of the year data to really make those quality instructional decisions. And so um, that data will just be so helpful in making those immediate um, instructional decisions for each child to personalize it for them. So we have a question. Uh, the first grade frame is quite easy to judge, but the second grade isn't. Could a trend line be added? Obviously not this evening. So <laughs> as to clarify what we're seeing. Warren, did you want to address that at all? Well, this particular one, that, that's, uh, we certainly can. This happens to be a uh, summary of that prior presentation. So we tried not to change a, a lot of the graphics for that reason, so that you had the same idea that, that the board received earlier on in March. 
And I would point out that uh, the dots on the right of the vertical line made progress and the dots that are above in the white area met target. So you're kind of seeing those who did both versus um, nearly all the students made progress. Any other questions? Yeah. Will this assessment be used for the state requirement to measure reading level A through two, or will iStation continue to be used? I would love to address that one. Um, we had, because we had been working on these, um, members of the board had contacted um, Representative Huberty, and he in turn uh, contacted um, Commissioner Marath, and they came out and wanted to see the information and the data and were impressed. Um, in fact, they sent out their own reading teams um, and wanted us to give them uh, the information and what we had done. Um, and it has been used in some of the information you're going to hear in a few minutes. Um, so regard, what they did was they gave us permission to use these in place of iStation. And because we had um, the data points built in, we had the cut scores, uh, we had started to identify cut scores. And they felt because we were doing this three times a year, we had actually much better data because it was teacher to student. So we're very excited about that. Any other questions? Warren, do you have additional slides? To I've share? got one more slide. Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. So the, the last slide has to do with the post-secondary enrollment. So this is a graphic of students uh, who enrolled in, in uh, college uh, at some point in their career. And we saw earlier that it was about uh, right around 55 to 60% of students enrolled directly after high school. Um, but the, the percentage who actually end up enrolling eventually is much higher. And so this graphic is, is, shows how, how many from the different classes, different cohorts of students from 2012 all the way to 2019, how many eventually enrolled in college. And so at the very bottom, you can see that it's around 80% of our students eventually uh, enroll in post-secondary uh, education. Whereas at the very top, uh, it's around 60% uh, or so for the class of 2019. And that's because they only had one semester uh, or just a few months to enroll. So those are the students who, who uh, immediately enroll in higher education. But as, as time goes on, we see that students do go on to college and so that, that number that, that we talk about with college ready uh, is really uh, a very low number compared to the, to, to the percentage of students that actually end up enrolling in post-secondary uh, studies. So I want to add to this um, and, and cannot do it nearly the justice that Dr. Fagan did at the board meeting, but what I think is so significant about these last three slides, so what Warren presented you at the beginning is really what the state is requiring of us. And while that's certainly um, informational, um, what, what we see with the last three slides are the things that uh, are near and dear to our own hearts. And so it's not just about looking at those items that the state tells us we have to look at, but it's about looking at those items that uh, quite honestly, the board and Dr. Fagan have charged. There are things beyond STAR, there are things beyond EOC that we value, that we know are hallmarks of student success, uh, that we know are, are things that all of our community uh, recognizes as, as valuable. And so, 
What I hope to, to see going forward is that there will be more of these measures that the community and that the district find valuable uh, because it, it's very difficult, as Ann mentioned, you know, you can't wait till the end of the year. And so it's, I think it's so important as educators and as family and as parents that we have these measures that we can look and see. No, it's not just that my child did well on a star math exam, because I'm not exactly sure what that means in their life journey, but that I can look at PSAT and SAT, and I can see them as young children with literacy assessments, and how many are enrolling in college, and, and there are so many others that, um, that teaching and learning and the schools division, all of us are working towards to be able to add to this. So I hope that as we move forward, you're going to see in the future more of these. So Dr. Roan, I think if you will stop sharing your screen and that will take us back to our agenda. So Mary Kay. She's moved. Mary Kay, you're muted. Apologies. Uh, in light of our COVID-19 situation, um, of course, we have some very unusual things going on. And one of the items has to do with the missed school days that we aren't physically in the school and how the state uh, will compensate for our ADA being we aren't taking attendance the normal way we do. So for school closures based on the COVID-19 related concerns, uh, TEA is allowing minute waivers from the agency in order to meet our minimum 75600 operational minute requirement. So these waivers will be granted as long as the school district commits to supporting students instructionally while at home, which of course we are doing very much. And attestation has to be submitted by the superintendent and the board president. Uh, stating that the district has continued instructing students from home and then TEA will grant the waiver for these missed school days. So we're in the process right now of putting before the board um, in the upcoming board meeting, we would like to put forth that we want to apply for this missed school day waiver. And um, we could not apply for it until the days were passed. They did not let us apply for future days. We have to apply afterwards. So we will be putting this application in, um, in after the next board meeting. If this goes before the board and is approved, then we will put in the waiver to TEA. And with the attestation, um, it will surely be approved. Um, they have committed to approving it if we're supporting the students at home. So we wanted to let you know that and to, uh, answer any questions about that going forward, if you have any. It's pretty open and shut, I think. We certainly want this. <laughs> but you'll have a chance in, uh, to also respond about that. So I think that then takes us to our uh, professional learning and uh, Melissa, I believe that you're driving this, this uh, car. I am sure going to try. Let me make sure I click the right button that Rusty told me to for computer sound. Okay, excellent. So um, I think it came up earlier. Uh, how are we responding to this in light of COVID-19? And I want to say that one of the things I think our department has really addressed is what you see on the screen in front of you, reimagining everything we do. We've had to completely um, revamp how we support campuses, how we support our teachers and our teacher leaders, um, how we do professional learning. Everything has been reimagined in light of this. 
Um, so we're going to give you just a little bit of an overview on that. Um, we, um, Stephanie Coronado is with me. She's my partner in professional learning here, and she's going to talk quite a bit about digital learning in a minute here because they were definitely our boots on the ground over spring break when we learned that um, we weren't going back to school after spring break and we needed a plan. So from the first day after spring break of March 16th to today, the teaching and learning department, just to give you a little taste of what we've been doing during this time, we've been doing weekly updates to the entire district based on the professional needs that teachers are reporting to us and what the principals are seeing that they need, being very responsive. Um, we have offered during that time Zooms and recorded sessions for them. Um, almost all of the Zoom sessions that we offered, we recorded and put back up on the internet so that if they were unable to make it because they were teaching their own Zooms, they could review any of our recorded sessions at their leisure and still get all the information that they needed. Um, we offered 985 sessions since spring break at this time with, um, let's see if that was over 670 hours of professional learning to our teachers and over 10,000 seats filled by our teachers during that time. So we've been very busy in making sure that we offer as many opportunities as we can to um, meet those needs. Stephanie, do you want to say anything else or do you want me to click to the next slide? You can go ahead and go to the next one. So obviously we have done a lot of online learning during this time period, but prior to that, um, we had been working with teachers all over to get them to use um, technology in their classroom and how to purposely integrate it, not just use the technology tool for the tool itself, but to increase the student engagement, um, to extend that learning and that thinking and to give the students a way to create and um, produce different um, activities or articles or artifacts of their learning. And so we had been working for several years now with our TILTS and that's a technology infusion leadership team. And we have at least one teacher from every campus some of our larger campuses have two representatives. And then this year we did something different where we built in our tilt leads and our co-leads. And so um, with this large group, we have over 50 members. We then broke them up into smaller tribes. And our whole purpose was for them to be influencers on the campus to try to um, be a support system for the campus when teachers were looking at ways to integrate technology into their lessons. And so um, I'll get to it in just a second, but we were, we were kind of excited when this next opportunity occurred for us. Um, another thing that we had done in this, this fall was we had created a Google and Beyond Action Team. And this was a partnership with Google. And um, we wanted to really look at computational thinking and coding and see how do those critical thinking skills impact our students and how can we make those um, lessons part of our everyday instruction. Um, not just necessarily the coding piece, but all of that thinking that goes into step by step. What do you have to do if you're wanting to solve a problem? And so we were really getting on a roll. We had 29 campuses that had participated in this and we were really jumping in to look at, okay, what does this mean for our students and moving forward? How can we prepare these kids to um, go out into the workforce and have that critical thinking that is so important with our portrait of a graduate competencies. So we were we were working on that. We had our just our meeting before spring break. Um, we actually had Google out and he spoke to the group about what skills they're looking for in students. And then we had a whole student panel that was there and presented things that they had done on their campus. So it's not just um, teachers that we're building capacity in, but also with our students to give them that voice and let them be able to share some of the things that, that they know that they're helping um, us as teachers too. Okay, so whenever um, COVID hit, um, as you remember, it was during spring break and 
Um, I'll never forget, it was the Thursday of spring break and we started thinking, oh no, that this is happening and we're going to have to think fast. Um, and so we worked nonstop Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because we wanted to be ready. We weren't sure how were schools supposed to respond necessarily. Everyone was still just figuring out whether they were not going to have school or not. And, and we knew we weren't coming back for that week, but we didn't know was that gonna be a long-term plan or what. And so we wanted to be able to provide so much support to our teachers so that they would be ready to go with their students um, as soon as possible. So we did develop a continued learning plan. And Melissa, if you wanna click on that link, um, I'll just show you real quick. Um, we talked about you know, the purpose, obviously, um, we needed to have a way to respond to our students, but it wasn't necessarily just because of COVID. We were trying to think of you know, when we have situations when we wouldn't have school, how could we continue the learning for our students? And we had to think about what were those components of the instruction? How did we, we didn't wanna just do what we were normally doing and put it into a, a Zoom meeting like this because that's not going to go well with the students. You have to have certain things in place so that the kids are engaged and that they're participating, um, which I'm sure many of you have already experienced and seen. Um, and if you'll go down, we won't go through the whole thing, but you'll see that we, offered a variety of platforms for our teachers, um, letting them know here's what the platform does, the, the advantages of it, the disadvantages. Um, and, and so we had several different options for them to choose from, and maybe they had a little bit of exposure or had heard about these things before COVID, but we were going to offer in-depth training for them. So they were able to pick and choose what did they feel was best for their teaching style um, and what did they feel like their class needed for March and, and beyond. And then below that, we also gave them information on how could they collaborate with their teachers, with their peers, with their staffs, and also with their students. So we had a lot of um, options for them to do and training on that as well. And then um, I think it's on the next slide, Melissa. Oh, you want me to go, sorry. Yeah, it's uh, okay. Or it's on the, um, the training link? Yes. Okay. So on this training link, I just wanted to share with you, this was the, um, just the first week of our online training that we had for the teachers. So starting that Tuesday after school was um, transitioned to online learning, we had sessions all day long, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for our teachers to participate in. And um, that first week, we really did concentrate on how could we provide the tools for the teachers, the platforms for them to use in their classrooms, such as choice boards, Pear Deck, Dojo, Flipgrid, and, and on and on for them. Um, we had a max number of participants as our kind of our threshold, but we had, I, I mean, I think over 300 teachers that first day and all week long, it was hundreds of teachers that were participating in these um, sessions and trainings and, and learning great things. Okay, now. So then after we, that first week after we looked at um, the platforms that we were going to use, we then tried to focus the training and, and our content coordinators came in and they were providing trainings as well for all um, content areas that were more specific for what teachers needed. We wanted to focus on engagement for them when they're doing online, because like I said, and as you know, it's, it's a very different type of teaching. Um, and then we focused on providing feedback for students. You know, that, that's critical in an online environment because you don't want them to feel like they're just submitting their assignments out there um, or they don't have that personal connection with their teacher. And so we provided sessions for teachers to give specific feedback for students so that they were learning and it was purposeful for them. And then we did assessments and how could you um, assess students, not necessarily just through a test, but different ways that they could 
um, produce different products. Um, and then we also did uh, celebrations just last week on, um, you know, what are all the great things that teachers have seen and done? And, and they are amazing, as you know, and the things that they have created. I mean, we've got digital sticker books and um, all kinds of awards and um, products, commercials, very real life relevant lessons and learning that the students have had the opportunity during this time where people at first were wondering, what are we going to do? Um, we did have a, our own site for the teachers that had all of this information that Melissa mentioned. So all of our sessions that we did, we recorded, and then we uploaded them to a site. So if teachers weren't able to attend, they could go back and um, watch them, or maybe they watched them but wanted to go back and, and get a refresher or try something else um, out and then go back and see if they needed to change anything. And so they had that resource um, to them available as well. And then one of the last things we did in, in relation to this was we also had a student help resource. So, you know, a lot of times students used those platforms, but they were using it in a classroom and with their teacher. And when they got home, they were thinking, mm, I'm not sure how do I use this? And so we had um, a whole place where they could go in and remember how, or had information on how them to sign in to different programs, or if they were trying to use something that their teacher had assigned, it would help them get to that through those platforms. Okay, and then on the next slide, we are not done. Um, we are, Looking forward to what the future holds. Um, we're busy planning our summer sessions and we have collaborated with our content coordinators um, so that now we had done it before. We're all one team, but we have purposeful collaboration with that purposeful integration of technology, like I mentioned before. We're expanding our training to elevate and engage students. So some of the things we had trained about during this last eight to 10 weeks, we're going to elevate that more of, this is what you did during this time, but then going back into the classroom, as you maybe have that blended learning model, here's ways that you can um, continue to use those tools and things that you've done in the past, the ones that the students have gotten used to using as well. Um, and it, just an example, um, we have designing personalized instruction, several sessions on that with stations and centers this summer. And then we're also looking at different stations on motivating and engaging students because um, just like you, you know, the students have been doing this for several weeks now. And so um, teachers have created different ways to keep students engaged so that whenever we go back or heaven forbid, if we have to be in this situation again, how do we get those students and, and keep them motivated and engaged in what we're doing? Are there any questions on the digital learning portion before we move on? So um, one of the next parts we wanna talk about, we've kind of let you know what we've been doing the last few months for professional learning. Now we're moving into our summer professional learning. And some of you are familiar with our power of possibilities, um, which we've been doing for the last three years. This was scheduled to be year four. So I put, we put just a little bit of the history up here for you to see how far we've come with power possibilities from 2017 to now. But like I mentioned earlier, we're reimagining everything as we go. And what we've realized is what we've had in the past isn't quite going to be the same um, anymore. POP um, really started out as a way for us to um, give teachers and campus administrators an environment to innovate in a safe place, try new things, Dr. Fagan said it beautifully, just take one step, try one, and that's really what POP started out to be. We also wanted to make sure that anything that they were doing was immediately applicable to them in the classroom, not abstract, not something that someday they could use, but they could turn around and immediately do it. Um, in light of this, we do have a few challenges for 2020 as this summer as we're moving into it. Um, we still want to provide that same high quality experience for our teachers and campus leaders, but this time in a virtual experience, as Stephanie has mentioned. 
And we really want to focus on a transition into the fall. Um, having so many unknowns, we want to make sure that we're giving them highly adaptable skills and plans that they can develop in these sessions and use as they move into the fall semester, whatever that may look like, or as it may need to adjust, as Stephanie mentioned, it may not be a one size fits all throughout the entire school year. Oh, I said the highly adaptable, sorry. Um, so today, actually, our um, reimagined summer professional learning has opened. The um, We opened it at four o'clock today. And just to give you guys a little sneak peek, within 10 minutes of being open, we had 25 sessions already at capacity. And until I got on this meeting, I've been on the phone with so many people begging them to open more sessions. And we're going to continue to try to adjust to meet that. But our summer professional learning um, this summer, we really want to focus on two main types of learning this summer because we are in a virtual environment. Um, we are going to offer face-to-face -face sessions through Zoom with our participants. That is one option that they have. And that we also have a series of e-courses that are going to be available throughout the summer. And these e-courses are going to vary in formats. Some of them are, all of them are self-paced, but some of them are going to be um, watching a recorded session from a previous Zoom session and then processing and doing something with it. Some of them take them to Google Sites or Google Classroom where they're collaborating with others in a virtual environment. So there's a lot of different experiences that our teachers are going to have through these different um, types of learning this summer. Um, the organizational structure, we have, again, a lot of options for them. We're looking at instructional design, student engagement, both um, in a physical environment and in a virtual environment, personalized learning, authentic assessment, and we have a large number of content-specific sessions that have come on board this summer, um, which we're very excited about as well. Um, and um, do, as Ann mentioned earlier, Dr. Mo, who built the um, reports for the literacy assessments for, for our teachers to use the parents, he also um, used his skills to help us build a, a base, which has made the process for finding and searching for sessions much more user-friendly for our teachers. One of the feedback that we have gotten oh, continually over the years is that it's a lot of work to look through all of the offerings and not all of them apply to everybody. So this new registration database, I like to compare it to Amazon because it gives us the ability to drill down and really click on the filters that we want to apply and only see the sessions that we really want to see. And I can actually show you real quick what it looks like. I have it pulled up here for you. So this is what our teachers see when they enter Dr. Moe's um, database that he created for us. And they get to choose between the virtual sessions and the e-courses. They, they can save favorites. So once they find the sessions they really like, they don't have to try to figure out what series of filters they put in place to go back and find those sessions again. They can click and save them and they'll just show up in their favorites. And it also gives them the ability to drill down by those different um, content areas and categories that I talked about just a minute ago. They can also sort by all of these different um, headers up here to really give them a lot of flexibility in their um, searching for the sessions that are most um, applicable to what they need and their goals with their um, students moving forward. Like I said, that opened today. So we've been um, working hard to meet all the needs there. So um, moving past that piece, let me put these all up here because it's kind of hard to talk through it. So as we look at our, our summer PL, our professional learning, and moving beyond just this summer, we really want to look at um, providing ongoing opportunities. Typically, POP is about two or three weeks in June for our teachers, but we're wanting to expand that quite a bit more, and especially since we're in a virtual environment and we're not restricted by physical buildings or access, there's no reason not to expand, expand it this summer. So we're going to have e-courses, recorded sessions, and several other options open all summer for our employees which not only is gonna give them more flexibility with their schedule and designing their own personal learning plan, but it's also giving them additional opportunities to earn the comp time. Um, you may know from this committee that 
Our district provides two comp days for our employees every year for the 2021 school year. They are in February, so our teachers do have some time to earn them, but they do need to earn comp time as well. So this will give them a little more time and more opportunities to pick some high quality sessions to earn that, as, uh, that time. Our future goals for our professional learning is that it really is a year long process that follows through with the teachers. We don't want it to be um, a one time event. We want them to be able to create processes and tools and really start digging deeper into what they're doing in their classroom and continuing what they take in the summer throughout the entire school year. Um, COVID has kind of given us um, a light, I think. When we started the Power Possibilities, we knew it was an event. It was a, it was a conference we were starting and we, um, it, it got us very far for what our purposes were in the first year, but now rethinking it, POP is really a different way of thinking altogether. It's a different way of doing things. It's not just an episodic uh, two-week conference in the summer anymore. It is a way of thinking and a culture that we wanna carry throughout the entire year. Anne, Melissa, or Stephanie, are there any things you want to add to this part? Oh, Anne, you're muted. The time constraints, I think we'll leave it at that. Perfect. Just one comment in the chat. You are all amazing. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I will make one comment. I cannot thank our team enough. They all put in uh, tons of hours because one of our expectations is that they design the sessions and they, there's, um, the criteria you, we use is it has to be engaging and it has to be something that teachers can, can, uh, can create and use in their classroom tomorrow. And so we try and make it as relevant as possible, but um, we appreciate your comment. I'm gonna, we are going to share two other things as we move into the future, into the fall, and, and into an uncertain time. Um, but we want you to be aware of them because both of these are going to um, also uh, encompass a lot of time, but also have tremendous possibilities. The first one is the Reading Academy. And this came about after reviewing long, longitudinal fourth grade reading scores across the state and concluding that the scores were consistently low. The 86th Texas legislature passed legislation contained in House Bill 3. And this legislation mandates that by 2021, 20, 21-22, school year that in order to be certified, all kindergarten and third grade teachers and principals have to master the science of teaching reading standards. And what that means is it's approximately anywhere between 45 and 60 hours because part of it is actual seat time and part of it is practice and coaching that takes place. Um, it's very time consuming and the state has, um, the TEA has put into place what they call their reading academy. I'm gonna transition now to a clip that Dr. Fagan was uh, kind enough to put together to introduce it to our teachers. A few years ago, Amal ISD was a little frustrated with the literacy information that we were getting from the assessments we were using. Um, we really want all of our students to be incredible readers. We understand that education is local and that it's personal, and we needed quality data to help us help our students grow from where they are to where they want to be. And we just didn't feel like we had that. So over the last few years, we started developing a literacy assessment by grade level that measures the things that we believe are very most important for our students to learn and grow and helps our teachers identify our students strengths and their challenges so they can be really specific about targeting those need areas instead of whole group instruction which really hasn't made a huge difference in the history of education. 
We also had the opportunity for materials adoption, a substantial one. And because we were working on this literacy assessment, we were able to buy the materials that made perfect sense with the work that we were going to do. We really created an humble bundle that is all about what we want our students to learn and be able to do in Humble ISD. We were on a terrific path and are on a terrific path. Then House Bill 3 came along and it changed a lot of things in education in the state of Texas. One of those things is it introduced the requirement for reading academies. And these reading academies are a very robust experience where teachers have to go multiple times throughout the year and experience individualized coaching, very educationally sound, but it caused us a bit of concern. Because what if in those reading academies, teachers were taught to use different materials? What if teachers were taught to look at different parts of literacy assessments? And all of a sudden, we had local staff who were not required to go to reading academies receiving one set of professional development instruction and a different set of staff who were required to be part of the reading academies going a different path, a divergent path for two different groups. In education, this has been a problem throughout our history where we don't really align all of our systems. We were moving in such a positive direction that we had to find a solution. Our solution was to build our own reading academy with our own materials, our own literacy assessments, one that aligns the work of 100% of Umbel ISD staff to the needs of our students, really focusing on the things that we know are most important in reading and literacy. One of the things that's the really important part of this system is that the teacher works with the student one-on-one -on -one to identify the needs of that student and then uses the materials we purchased to move that student along a path of progress. Well, that's what our literacy and our reading academies are all about. And we were just concerned that the ones that are going to be popped up in other places may not fit. So we're working with the state of Texas, with the commissioner, to also make sure that we can continue down the path that we value for our students in Humble ISD. And we are excited about the work that's happening here for all of our young readers. Well, obviously, <laughs> the June dates are not going to come off. And the other thing is, um, uh, Dr. Fagan is not that robotic. Uh, it's an issue with bandwidth because when we tried it earlier, it was it worked fine. So um, I apologize to her, but I think um, the message still came through that, and a lot of that is because of the work our teachers and our staff have d have done over the last three years. That we are in a position where. Uh, the state has allowed us to design our own reading academy, and it's tied to all of our new literacy adoption. It's tied to our literacy assessments, but we still, with the condition that we still integrate the pieces that are part of what the state has required. And so there are 13 classes, um, and we are in the process of developing our version of those right now. Um, so it's a very labor intensive process. As you can imagine, we had planned to start them in June. We now are delaying them until November, just because with the beginning of fall and the uncertainty of how we will be starting back, um, we just wanna give our teachers a chance to get their feet on the ground and get to know the students uh, before we have to start it. But there is a, an 11 month requirement that once we start it, we have to complete it all in 11 months. Um, the wonderful news is that um, it's foundational training that teachers just need, and it's so critical to literacy instruction. The other thing is because we believe so strongly in literacy instruction in this district, we also are developing um, an adaptation for the fourth and fifth grade teachers um, because we feel that this is crucial as well. So there'll be more to come for that, and uh, we're very excited about being able to put that in place. Another thing that's on the horizon is what we call instructional learning sets. Um, the commissioner recently um, shared with the superintendents that um, he has, is recommending that we move to, uh, toward an outcomes-based learning approach. And again, this is because we have to have something that is adaptable because if we're able to start back uh, to school, which we 
um, all hope we are able to do, then we, it still provides a solid base um, for learning. But it also is a system that allows you to make that transition if you need to move to a blended or to a virtual setting. And so the, um, what happens in an outcomes-based approach is it really focuses on what we want students to know and be able to do. The TEKS are embedded in it, but we don't teach to the discrete TEKS. There's an overarching outcome that you really teach to. And then within those are the uh, TEKS that we have to pay attention to. It's adaptable for, like I said, classroom, blended and virtual learning. It ta targets higher expectations. And that is very consistent with where the district is headed. It also has a very flexible format to support instruction. And it's user friendly for teachers, parents and students. Because we know that in some situations like this spring, the teacher was able to do some Zoom sessions, but we know particularly in the lower grades in elementary, the parents played a role as the teacher. So the learning sets we're putting together can be used by a teacher, a student, and or a parent, and we're working hard on those. Um, and all of these align to our vision and goals of student engagement, authentic learning, and, and certainly high quality curriculum. I've asked Debbie Perez, who is one of the chairs for the committee that's working on putting this together, to share with you a couple of sneak preview, very rough drafts of what this is going to look like. And this has gone through a very um, intensive process. We have a large team of people, representatives from campuses and our own team, who have all, um, reached out to people across the country who are doing similar work, um, have thought about the work that we, previous work we've done with curriculum frameworks and high quality unit design. And we're working to pull all those pieces together um, into a format that will provide the focus for an outcomes-based learning approach. I'm gonna ask Debbie to come on and share those examples. Yeah, so what you're about to see, you are actually um, one of the first groups that were sharing this initial prototype or version. Um, we've gone through, a, like Ann said, a quite an extensive process to have our teams of uh, within teaching and learning and the feedback that we're getting, like, hey, look at your curriculum frameworks, look at your units, look at the current quality curriculum elements that we have in the system that our teachers are using. How can we move it to the next step so that we're focusing on developing um, what we're calling the learning sets? What do we take from these components and really help um, uh, create some samples that can show teachers and students and parents how we take those standards and really mold them around learning essential questions? So what you see before you is that initial prototype of taking those standards and those skills and really filtering them through um, a learning outcome and an essential question that will really give purpose and meaning behind the teaching of those standards and skills. And so what each content area has been able to do is kind of take this initial prototype and see if um, it works within the system that we currently work on. And it, it because it is the next phase and evolution of our components, uh, we've seen some really, really cool results that we're excited to feature during our professional learning this summer, during our curriculum writing that we're continuing with teachers and alts and, um, and, and the support that we're providing. So I'm about to show you a very quick one, uh, a math example. Uh, my background is ELA, but I'm certainly going to try to walk you through this. I'm not making any promises. Uh, Melissa, go ahead and click. There you go. So uh, secondary math took this set and working along the cycle of a strong design learning principles, how can I take my standards at the math level, um, really focus on those problem solving skills and those processes that really help students uh, create that learning and create that experience around those math standards. So this is one example of how a content team was able to take that initial prototype and now go, okay, for math, how does this cycle work? How does this, how do these curriculum components and learning outcomes and essential questions that we've been able to really mold at the unit level? What does it look like at a day-to-day -day level? Um, whether I'm face-to-face -face 
whether I'm in a blended environment, whether it's online instruction solely, how do I rely on these principles and these components to really help me center my teaching on engagement and those skills that we value within the content that's being taught. So uh, just wanted you to see a version of what a team has done. Um, so you have an example to kind of preview what other content teams are doing. Uh, it, it looks slightly different and that's the beauty of it because we're able to kind of take the strong learning principles of the prototype and see how does this work with the content, with the teaching, with those salient skills and characteristics that each uh, subject has, um, but make some consistency and some language across the board um, pretty uniform so that parents and students who are having to access multiple learning sets um, can recognize the language, can recognize the expectations. So again, no matter what uh, or how we start the year, there's going to be some consistency through that format, but uh, really working around some flexible structures for each of the content. So. Debbie, if I could interject something, one of the things as we've designed this is we've not only had to work through the design and what works for each curricular area, but the other thing is to think about the questions we need to ask. And for instance, okay, if, the, if we're putting this together as a sample, as a, um, a starting point for a teacher, does it allow for flexibility so a teacher doesn't feel like it's a prescribed lesson? that it allows for that personalization if they're working with a student on site. Also, if they're not on site and we need to go to a virtual setting, is there enough detail that the student then, with the teacher perhaps doing a Zoom introduction, can pick it up and work from that um, with some coaching and some guidance? So, and the other questions that it raises is what kind of training would the teachers need so they do know that it's adaptable, it is flexible, and what kind of training would parents and students need? Because if we're, I think that this would help with the concerns that the commissioner has, which is one, that the, high, the expe expectations next year for instruction have to be higher. Uh, we were in a situation this year where schools did the best they could in uh, you know, a very short period of time. But we also are all very concerned about the uh, student learning um, and how much of it didn't take place just because of all the changes and adaptations. And so what we need to work for, toward is more consistency, but because also there's going to be a, a greater expectations for accountability. So we just wanted you to see a rough draft of one, they continue to fine tune and hone this and we're actually going to be sharing it with, with other people over the next couple of weeks for their feedback. Are there any questions? We just wanted to give you, um, wanted to share what we've been working on um, and what we're starting and um, expanding upon as we move in uh, to the summer and also looking ahead to next year. Okay, I don't see any other questions posted in the chat. I wanted to uh, thank all the, the people who presented information today. As you can see, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes and we know there's a lot of work going on on the front lines for all the work that you're doing. So we thank you as well. At this time, I want to point out that in the calendar drop that you received for this Zoom, which would have looked like this, if you scroll down to the bottom, there is a DDM agenda PDF. When you open up that PDF document, you will see the full agenda. We would very much appreciate if you could today, um, but certainly by next Wednesday, if you would click on the link for a DDM feedback, it will take you to a a survey that we try to set up in a way that would value your time and that if you think that we're on the right target with each of these items you would select the first choice and if you have su suggestions or recommendations of something that we could change or improve upon select other and add your comments there and Melissa 
So there, there are a few people that I need to recognize before we dismiss or adjourn. Um, I, I do want to say this was, um, this was quite an adventure to put this together on a virtual setting. Um, I'd like to say that now since uh, March the 16th, we've all become much more um, adept at using uh, such things as Zoom, but I have to uh, recognize there, there are a group of people who really have made this opportunity uh, come together. And so if we would just, I just want to take a minute. Um, Ginger Curtis, who has been definitely my right hand through all of this. Um, Margaret Baker and uh, Mary Kay and Jamie as well. And then last but not least, uh, Rusty Odom, who is kind of the behind the scenes man who is making sure that we are all working technically on this. And so I, I wanted to publicly recognize this team and, and thank them for their work. And so um, please make sure that you complete the feedback for Jamie so that we can complete those steps for district decision making. And last, thank you so much for your time this evening. I know how exhausted everyone is. Uh, May is always a difficult time, I think, for everyone, irregardless of your role. Um, I know that uh, parents have had their children home much longer than they anticipated. And um, I wanna thank you for your time and value your um, input. And so please have a good evening and uh, hopefully we will hear from you soon. Good night.